Right, so after um, listing a bunch of APIs, um, we're going to go through the um, Hello World and Matrix Multiplier that you can download in the SDK and show you how they're actually used to um, hang on the machine that can look at the code. Um, because the programs are quite large, it's not going to all fit in a slide. I've tried to make it so that it's easy enough to follow without having the entire program, but um, then again, if anything seems missing, just you know, in particular, what you notice is missing is um, so that the text size isn't tiny, there's not going to be a thousand lines of int i, comma j stuff all over the. So first with the um, Hello World, what we'll, um, what we'll achieve is um, the host will allocate space for which a call can um, put its message and then program Hello World and then it will put the program onto each call and then one call at a time the um, Epiphany chips will be will write a hello world from my core ID a number of times, and in the end, you will see. So that is what we're trying to achieve. So um, the first stage is the code on the Epiphany core is going to be quite simple because it's just a standard, to an extent it's just a standard Hello World. Um, with the exception of, um, what, because we haven't got, actually got anywhere to print to, we're going to have to print to a shared buffer. So in that case, we'll be using um, sprintf instead of just printf. Right to the section where um, we specify that the program uh, lives in the shared memory. And because this, this is the only um, shared object during this um, program, we know it will be at the start of the shared memory, so we don't have to worry any further about that. And section is a, a GCC attribute. Yeah. Wrapped up in a hash defined to make it easy to use. Um, so that we have a more useful message, um, we, are also, we also are using the um, get core ID function from the um, e library, which will basically return what is my We'll turn your core identifier, which on the right hand screen you can see, for example, 0xHCA is one particular core. And that's it for the program we're running the epiphany. The rest is just initialization. To begin with, we, initialize, we reset the um, board and get information about the Back on what's missing there is um, the giving it the hardware description. So there should be here. Oh, no, it is. Um, we can then uh, we then allocate the same shared memory that we had in the host program, which is of size, is it 200 bytes? And then for one of a number of iterations, what we are doing is we choose a random core, uh, calculate its absolute core ID, and um, open a work group of just one device. Well, next we load the 
Hello World program, which we compiled and converted to S record format, and tell it to automatically run the program. And then we wait for 10 seconds. No, that's not. Um, we wait for the, um, we just wait for a moment of time and then read the message back and print it. And that is the simplest program that you could write. Now to build this, if, um, essentially you have to um, build the um, ARM program and the Epiphany program separately and convert it to an S record and run it and you get the up on the screen there. Can you just go back up slightly? I'm going to ask a few questions. And one call. To be clear, that GCC on the host side application, that's the GCC on the ARM. That's the GCC yeah, on the ARM. So this was being built on the ARM. If this is a local this one. one. This is local. Yeah, this is compiling it on, on there. So you if we were doing it on here, you'd have like ARM, Linux, uh, EABI, HF, or whatever. GCC. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm sorry, I missed um, how the shared memory is linked up in the host program and the core program. Um, Um, in the Epiphany program, it's we just allocate yeah. it as a section there. Yes. And is that in, in that section that shared? But that, that section is defined in the link of script, so that at link time it knows that has a set address. So that when I, I mean, is it the same shared DRAM amongst all the cores you're running this on? Yes. So they're all writing into the same buffer. Yeah. Hence we're doing only one core at a time. Yeah. The oh, I see. You're seeing yes, yes, yes. we're, we're, ah, right. we're just calling a random call. Right. Okay. I've got you. Otherwise, yes. And why do some of them not actually respond? Because there's no synchronisation. It's just a micro sleep. Right. Yes. Okay. So how would you put the synchronisation in? Um, you would have another shared object, and you would poll for. Interestingly, I've noticed it's anything in column in column two that's not printing. So. First trouble. I'm not sure because three is working. Race conditions. It's always been executing. Anyway, debugging aside. <laughs> so the program doesn't work, basically. <laughs> <laughs> you fire it. Well, welcome to the world of parallel programming. <laughs> Demonstration succeed. If I speed, if I speed through quickly, would you see debugging? <laughs> you see, with the formal mathematical stuff, you get to prove it. Any other questions before I move on to the so, other? Can I just, because I didn't quite get that memory thing as well, but you knew it was the first 128 bytes of that shared memory? Because it was the only thing we were putting in shared memory, okay. we didn't have to, yes. If, if there were more things, then we'd have to explicitly um, go, okay, so we know it's so far in. Other than at this stage, you have really? to manually manage your shared memory. Yeah. So if I have two programs and they declare two things in shared memory, I'll go back to the one where you declare it on the, on, on the title. Yeah, where you say section shared DRAM, if I had another program which declared thread buff, which was 64, and I put in section shared DRAM, they'd be overlapping each other. Or does the linker know it's going to be? If it's the same binary, then no. Because you're just allocating it to the next Yes, place. but if I had two different binaries, how do, is there a way of saying, put it in shared DRAM and offset X? Um, presumably, but I think or is that not? Because 
each team have its way level, each have a little area from that often. There's there's a um, there's references for I can't remember what it's called, but there's like a my part of shared DRAM, so you could so the linker script has um, specifying <coughs> for um, my specific part if you wanted to do that. Mm -hmm. So the GCC that's written on the arm in the host, that's just standard, that's just standard, standard. GCC, so yeah. you could compile whatever you wanted on that. Form. Yeah. Even, would it be possible to compile like a JDM or something like that? So well, it's just standard, standard GCC. Yeah. Yeah. So for the matrix multiply, there is um, on the host side, it's not that much different. It's not that different except you're telling all the calls to start at the same time. Whereas on the host side, um, sorry, on the epiphany side, there's a bit more to it. Um, to, I haven't got the image here, but to step through what we're going to achieve is um, a n by n size array is going to be split up into set uh, chunks for each call to process. Each call will fetch that section from DRAM. Um, work out the first part of the matrix multiply for each thing that's output and will then write that block to the call across. So using the more efficient write to your neighbor call rather than having each call fetch from memory, uh, fetch from DRAM n times. Once the final iteration is complete, it will run the result back in DRAM, which the ARM can then pull back in. So it goes, is the algorithm, is, the, is it only the input data that gets shunted to the to the neighbor to the right, or is it actually the... The input, if you shift, right. if you shift the left so and the intermediate calculation down. results, it's just the input. Yes, yes, so you calculate only for your section. Um, at a top level, we um, the course um, first sets up a um, a set of barriers for synchronization, so that each core doesn't execute um, ahead of where it has to, which is extremely useful for when we're writing memory to the next to our neighbor calls. We don't want it to start processing data until it's finished. And um, next we have a block here which if the first call in the um, group um, will signal back to the ARM system that will wait for the um, ARM sorry, to say that we're ready to execute. At which point we do our matrix multiply wait for the course to finish, and then signal back to the arm that we have to the way of the um, results ready to pull back. Um, initialization can, um, this program has an initialization function which sets up um, things like the um, DNA engine so that it can fetch data from DRAM um, quicker and sets up pointers to various bits of internal memory so that calculation can begin. And the basic um, um, for the big matrix multiply is in essence if your code is small enough there's just that in a loop. And this outer bit um, handles the case where even splitting the program up we can't fit it all into internal memory. But generally that's
um, for each subsection, we we erase our um, internal uh, accumulation so that we're not adding up anything we shouldn't. And then one core at a time, we fetch uh, the two ma the, our subsection of matrix A and matrix B from the D line. Um, why do you need a, Sorry, why do you need a, a mutex round there so that it's a read? Just so that you're not hammering the, you know. I'm not sure what would happen if you had all the calls trying to signal the DRAM all at once. I think first transfers are faster, but you have to keep on sending the address across and get it all up. Second okay. address is faster then. In that case. <laughs> Then we do a standard matrix multiply and for that um, section. And as I was saying, if you didn't have a picture, um, each call then writes its matrix A part to the call to its right and its matrix B part to the call below it um, so that it doesn't have to. Uh, keep track of, it doesn't have to keep fetching each part of, each part of make the two input matrices are only fetched once from DRAM. Um, we use two buffers for this, so that on the first iteration we use the first buffer, on the second iteration we use the second buffer, and so that's so that we can write to our neighbor's call without overwriting the data it wants to send to its neighbor. And then we wait for all the calls to signal that it's done. Repeat this root ten times and oh yeah, apparently. Um, okay. What I should say then is in essence the reverse of that. Uh, which basically each core then writes its final result back. Uh, <coughs> call zero then signals to the arm um, the calculation is complete. On the host side, uh, the initialization looks very much the same. Except it has this shared, um, this shared um, mailbox object, similar to the string in the previous example, which it stores um, how um, it stores whether the program's ready and whether the result's ready. It then loads the same program across a bunch of different calls. And then initializes a matrix and copies it to the shared memory for processing. Um, using the e write to write to the known location of the input object. It then waits for the call, the um, calls to say it's finished its initialization, sets it to um, start running, and waits for the result back. And finally, reads the result back to very similar to before, just with with exchanging more information. In the case of the example, so that we can verify it works, it does a it does the matrix multiply itself on the ARM board, and if the result is right, then everything's good. If not, 
Um, building is very much the same two lines, except if you look at the example, um, this example has a make file, so you can just run it. The, um, sorry, the build script calls a make file to build the particular target. And then, if you run it, And now you see that it's worked. Right. Um, for those host side timers? Yes. So the, um, the time for the epiphany includes the time spent copying memory to copying the input um, matrices and copying the top map. Do you have any idea of the overhead that is? Is it good genetic program to put them over the timers? But yes, um, slightly much, that's the end of the example. Any questions? If we wanted to know what the effect of the um, the relative, the different ways of copying from the DRAM into, onto the chip memory, we'd have to start putting timers into the uh, yes, inside you can, chip. Yes, you can see timers that are uh, described in the previous talk of either the total number of instructions, the total number of clock cycles, or you could. I think one of the options you could choose is there's different ones based on how long you've been waiting for memory, which depend. You know, if you're optimizing. Memory latency might be more interesting.
believe it, yes. Um, bear in mind, with the matrix multiply, if you think you've got 64 cores now, you've got 64 cores there, so you're doing an 8 by 8 sub matrix on each core, and you're copying, there's a lot of copying going from core, because you do a sub bit and pass the result on. We haven't actually got the slide up that shows the algorithm. It's a well known algorithm for the matrix multiply. Well, we do a bit, pass it on, do a bit, pass it on, and it works really well in this well, sort of architecture. You actually have good communication as you, you pass partial results around the uh, process. So there's a lot of comms going on. Oh, it's SLC0 definitely used.